How's it going? And today we're going to take a quick and dirty look at this simulation template in Unreal Engine 5.2. You might want to upgrade to 5.21. So to get started with this, we're just going to go simulation, blank simulation, and create. And there's some really cool things about this template that might encourage you to make your game in it or create your environment in it. And I'll just explain some of that as we go. Now there's some things about this that initially that might be confusing. And so I wanted to touch on those and just give you kind of a quick and dirty tour of some of the features of this template. The first thing to note is that it's actually fairly simple. It's got some geo-referencing system in it. It's basically got complete environment in it for all the way from sun and clouds and sky to stars and outer space. So you've got a complete day and night system in here and that's a real plus. And then in terms of the actual environment, all you've got is this really massive floor that's 8,000 by 8,000. And so it's not infinite, but it's it's really big. It takes a while to get to the to the end of this plane. And you'll see what I mean in just a minute. Now, one of the most confusing things about this is that normally when you come into a template, the game mode is already set to whatever that template is. And there is a game mode for this template, but we don't need to set it because it's all these components are gonna spawn in. So what do we have? We have a BP pawn, then we've got the game mode, and then we've got this controller. And then we have this widget that you'll see where that comes in in just a minute. Now, let's just kind of go through these real fast and show what each one is but if I hit play just to show you where we're at we're in the pawn right now and if you look over here on the outliner you'll see that our pawn is spawned in the game mode is spawned in and the controller has all spawned in and we can move around just like any regular controller W S A D Q and E one real modification here is that if we're going W and I turn the scroll wheel forward I can really speed up like really speed up incredibly fast. And then if I hit the middle mouse button down, I can slow down. I can start slowing down just to normal, normal speed. Now, if you want to ever know what those controls are, you can just double click into the BP pawn and you can see all these controls are here. If we go into the event graph, you can see mouse will up or forward is increase max speed down decrease middle mouse button slow. So really there's no difference between this pawn and any other pawn. It's in the default pawn class from the parent class. It's just a souped up with some additional controls in it. That's the only really advantage it have. And if we go into the mesh component here and go to the viewport. Hey, how's it going? I just wanted to do a super quick update to a video I just did on the simulation template. And in there we added a sphere to the BP pawn here. What I didn't realize, we were on a mesh component and we couldn't see it. And I went ahead and added another sphere. There's no need to do that. Turns out that the visibility for this is off, is all we needed to do. So if we go to visible and just turn on the rendering, there's a sphere already there. So you don't need to put in a sphere. And the other thing is, since it's a mesh, a static mesh, we can replace it with any other thing that we want. I'm just grabbing something weird here, like uh, this rail thing. No, oh, that's kind of small. Let's grab something else. Oh, this thing. We could grab this as our pawn. So the beauty of this is that if we come in here and I hit, well, let me drag another pawn on here. So if we hit play, anything can be the static mesh, anything that we want. Now there's no materials on this, but so this could be a spaceship or a rocket or whatever. So in other words, the pond can be any item that you want it to be. So just forget about that part I said about adding a sphere and make sure when you do that it's set to movable. I've made that mistake a few times. We won't be able to see this, but we'll be able to see its shadow. So if we go back into the game and we hit play, you can see the shadow of our sphere. And as we're moving along, you'll see the shadow. So this could be like a low flying jet or something like that. It doesn't have to be a sphere, it can be anything. And you can see its shadow right there, 
right down there. So that's really cool. And the other thing is if we hit play, and again, these are some of the features. Now, to show you, let's say there's a quite a few menu buttons or keyboard buttons. And if you don't want to go online and look up what the documentation is, you don't have to. You can just double click into the player controller. And if you go on the event graph, it basically shows you what does what. So in this particular simulator, home basically creates, these are all day to night settings that are kind of cool that you could use in a simulation. Home takes you to noontime and page up takes you to dusk. And then page down basically increases the day night cycle. And then here's another one that's really interesting is enter. And basically that allows you to switch between your pawn, they call it the free floating pawn, and the last pawn on the level. In this particular case, we don't have any other pawn in the game. And so there, if I hit enter, nothing's going to happen. So, but be aware of those controls. And then down here on the widget, if you press P, it brings up controls to assess the performance level of your game. And then there's also G for georeferencing information. So let's take a quick look at all those right now. So if I hit play, I'm in the game. And if I hit P, those are the stats I'm telling you about. And this is why I think this could be ideal for creating a game because it allows you to test your game at different frame rates. It shows it's real easy to bring up the stats, the units, the engine. You just click twice to open and close each window. And so that's why I say you can assess very easily the impact your game is having on your system. It's just very easy to at different frame rates too. So this is really a handy feature. And you then you just hit P again to come off of it. Excuse me, P. I just have to click them off to get rid of them. Okay. And then if you hit G on the bottom, there's some geo referencing information there. And I didn't realize this before, but I guess I have to unclick these units off so they'll stay on the screen. So if I hit P and I leave the button on and the menu goes away, but the stats stay. So I guess you got to unclick that. Okay. So P gets rid of the menu and then you have to toggle the individual buttons. Okay. And there's that. Now, if we hit the, what is it? Page up, you'll see that we're going to change to dusk and where's the sun? Look, so if I hit the home button, it goes to noon time and I hit page up, it goes to dusk. And I hit home and it goes back to noon. And you can see the sun. If I hit page down, it slowly loops through the whole day night cycle, which is really cool. And actually goes into nighttime with the stars, which is super cool. And then it comes back and you can actually see the sun go across the sky. So that could be really useful in an animation. Okay, and I'll just hit home to go back to that. So there's all that. And then what's even greater about this now, knowing that we have a souped up widget, is that if I hit E to ascend and I turn the scroll wheel, I can ascend pretty darn quick into literally space. So that's where we're going. And if I look down, you can see how big the plane is. Like I said, I don't know how big it is, but I think it's a few miles. So it's not infinite. So, and then look, we're in outer space. It's super cool. Now you notice the clouds are tiled. And if you want to get rid of those, just delete them from the outliner or scale them to create a different, you know, to get rid of that kind of UV mapping tiled look. Now, if you want to get back down to Earth or where you were, you can hit Escape, click on the Sun Sky, and hit F, and it takes you right back down here to kind of ground zero. So those are just some of the nifty features that this has. Now, the last thing I want to show you is if I hit Play again, we're in the BP Pond, and we're flying around, and we can go really fast or really slow. We can reset our speed and all that, and we can see the shadow of our pond right there which is kind of cool. Now, if we wanted to actually see this pawn or switch into another pawn, I can hit escape and grab this and drag it into the scene. Now this is going to be not a spawnable pawn, but this is going to be a persistent or possessable pawn. 
So if I hit play, I can see that second pawn and you can see the shadow of the spawnable pawn moving and then there's that pawn over there. Now, it's hard to get your bearing sometimes, so let me just get uh, a cube here real fast and then just drag this on the scene just so we have some sort of frame of reference because it's really weird when there's you got a spawned pawn and then you've got this. So I'm gonna I'm way over here and there's our cube and there's our possessable or persistent pawn. So now if I hit play, I'm in the spawn pawn. And let's say I'm gonna come way over here and notice like the direction of the shadow. And if I hit enter, I'm gonna jump over into the perspective of that pawn way over there. So now I'm in this other pawn and there's the spawn pawn over there. So you hit enter and you're jumping between pawns. And all of this, if you're interested in how that's programmed, is you just come into the player controller and you can see that logic is here, which is kind of interesting. So when you hit enter, the spawn pawn is a zero value, right? So if it will be, it has an index value of zero, the spawned pawn. So that's going to be true. So if that's true, then it gets any other pawn that's on the level and possesses it. And then the next time you press enter, it's not gonna equal zero because you've got a different pawn and then it's gonna go false and then it's gonna grab the initial pawn that you had. So it's just a way to toggle between if you have two pawns, at least two pawns. And then down here, what you can do is bring in additional pawns and then assign index values to those pawns and then jump between several different pawns just by pressing one, two, three, four, five, six. So to do that, all you'd really do is you'd come in here and I can just show you real quick what you'd need to do to do that. You'd come in here and go to variable and you could just call this pawn number and we'd set it to an integer. And then what you could do is on event begin graph, you could go get actor of class. And what we'd want to do is get that variable. Oh, we'd want to make it instance edible. And we'd get this in the value here that would be entered on the pawn. And then we drag off of here and go set. I think it's called player index level level index I think or something level maybe I have to compile oh I didn't set the class I got to set it to BP controller and compile that and then I go get I think it's called get level pawn or no I want to set level pawn index and then we would just plug this in here and that into there. And then if we come in here and we let's say we dragged another pawn on to the to the game. If we come down in its details panel, you can see that we could set the value over here, the pawn number. So I think um, two is one. So oh so it's a one. So we're giving this pawn a value of one. Save, hit save, and if I come into the game and I want to get to that pawn, I would hit two, and now I'm at that pawn's perspective. See that? So anyway, hope you found this helpful. Take care, have a great day, and I will talk to you next time.